We all love a good story about the underdog rising up and defeating the bad guy. There are a lot of these throughout history, but while some are tales of triumph, others are tales of caution and demise. Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium, and in this episode of Perspectives, four experts share stories of fights that were won by the underdog, and a few others that are only remembered for their colossal failure. We begin now, in the late Middle Ages, with a battle between French knights and Flemish peasants. The two armies were roughly equal in total number of men. But the French forces were all professional soldiers, and included thousands of mounted men, versus the Flemish, who were overwhelmingly amateurs and were almost all on foot. To a medieval observer, the sides would have seemed hopelessly mismatched in that one category that was most valued on battlefields, knights. The Flemish army was drawn up with their backs to the walls of Courtrai and a nearby river, and there was a large field between them and the French army. The selection of this site to make their stand it was a clever one. Because, like much of the Flemish countryside, that intervening field was low-lying, wet land, which was uh, traversed by a number of streams and water channels. Such terrain was not well-suited to charging horsemen. On the other hand, they had backed themselves into a position from which there could be no retreat. They simply had to win, or they would all be killed. And the fight began with the French crossbowmen unleashing a rain of bolts. The Flemish crossbowmen, who were stationed in front of the main line, replied with shots of their own, and a duel of missiles ensued. The French were more numerous and were also supported by infantry, so they drove back the Flemish crossbowmen, who then took shelter behind the main line. The French crossbowmen and foot soldiers were eager to press their advantage, and they might have done so to good effect. But Robert, fearing that they might defeat the Flemish on their own, ordered them back to make way for his knights. The battalions of aristocratic knights ponderously began to move forward, but they couldn't build momentum on the swampy ground. Then, when they had to cross those little streams, it brought their advance to a standstill. After awkwardly picking their way across, they continued on towards the Flemish line, which bristled with lowered pikes. On the right and left sides, the Flemish line managed to blunt the onslaught. But in the center, French knights cut their way into the Flemish formation and threatened to break through. Seeing this, the commander of the Flemish reserves brought up his troops to bolster the line. Knots of pike and hooded-docked brandishing militia clustered around each knight, hacking and poking until he fell from the saddle, and then pounding on the fallen man until finally someone managed to insert a blade or a point into a weak spot in the armor. After three hours of intense combat, the battle was finally winding down. It was an utter disaster for the French. Thousands of France's best warriors lay dead on the bloody field. Among them were 75 high lords and around 1,200 knights. In the aftermath of the battle, the golden spurs worn by 500 of these knights were collected together and mounted on the walls of a nearby church. And it's because of this that the battle has sometimes popularly become known as the Battle of the Golden Spurs. The Battle of Courtrai halted French attempts to seize the region and it made possible the eventual creation of the Netherlands and Belgium as independent states. At San Antonio, Santa Ana fought the Battle of the Alamo. A few months earlier, the Texas rebels had ejected a Mexican garrison there, and this was an insult he meant to redress. The old half-ruined mission church of San Antonio de Valero, better known as the Alamo, was the American strong point, but it was not easy to defend. It would have needed about a thousand men in view of its crumbling walls and large perimeter, but was actually garrisoned by only about 150, 
with a few women and children, some cattle and corn, and a fierce determination not to retreat. The leaders of the rebels were William Travis and Jim Bowie. Houston had actually ordered Travis and his men to abandon the Alamo and destroy it, rightly foreseeing that it was indefensible and that the men would be of more use in swelling the ranks of his army. Travis had ignored the order in a series of defiant letters that closed with the valediction, victory or death. Most of the men inside the Alamo with him were recent arrivals in Texas, including Bowie, a slave trader, smuggler, and notorious knife fighter, and the half-legendary frontiersman Davy Crockett. Crockett had until recently been a Whig congressman from Tennessee. Inevitably, after a 13-day siege, Santa Ana's force overwhelmed the defenders and killed the survivors, possibly including Davy Crockett, while suffering 600 casualties in the process. Meanwhile, another Mexican general, José de Urrea, was marching a second force along the coast, where his troops defeated a Texan force in the town of Goliath. Just as Santa Ana had killed all the men at the Alamo, so Urrea massacred 371 prisoners of war, further poisoning relations between Mexicans and the Texans. For a month, Houston continued to retreat, and Santa Ana to advance. More men, shocked by the Mexicans' brutality at the Alamo and Goliath, joined his force. Finally, on April the 21st, 1836, he turned and fought at San Jacinto, despite being outnumbered. His 800 men, shouting, Remember the Alamo, surprised the Mexican force of about 1,500 men by advancing in mid-afternoon. This was the siesta hour. According to legend, Santa Ana himself was enjoying himself with his mistress, a mixed-race woman known as the Yellow Rose of Texas, in a luxurious tent. Some versions of the story say that she was loyal to the Americans and had deliberately set about distracting him at the crucial moment. The fighting lasted barely half an hour, after which the victorious Texans responded to recent Mexican atrocities by slaughtering hundreds of their prisoners of war. Santa Ana himself fled the battlefield, shedding his elaborate uniform en route, but he was picked up early the next day and brought back to face Sam Houston. Houston himself had been shot in the ankle, lost a lot of blood, and was in intense pain. Otherwise, the Americans lost only nine men killed. Many of his soldiers wanted Houston to kill Santa Ana there and then. Houston, however, had the good sense to realize that this was a symbolically important moment, that he was dealing with a head of state and that the eyes of the world were upon him. He saw the greater benefits of showing that he was civilized rather than vindictive. He therefore spared Santa Anna's life and compelled him to sign the Treaty of Velasco, ending the war, acknowledging Texas as an independent state and setting its southern boundary at the Rio Grande. The newly independent Texans at once convened a Congress to affirm the legality of slavery. It's one of the great embarrassments of Texas history that theirs was a revolution undertaken in part to ensure the continuation of slavery in an area that had recently abolished it. And so at 12 noon on Easter Monday, 1916, about 1,500 Irish rebels took to the streets of Dublin and seized multiple sites within the city center and held them by force of arms. The Easter Rising had begun. The 1,500 Dublin rebels on that Easter Monday occupied a number of buildings and sites throughout central Dublin. One key area included St. Stephen's Green on the south side, in the heart of Georgian Dublin. Here, some of the fiercest direct fighting occurred. Another was Boland's Mill on the Grand Canal. Here, Eamon de Valera was the commander, and the position was so secure that it actually saw little fighting and surrendered with great reluctance. Jacob's Biscuit Factory and the South Dublin Union on the south side were areas of major fighting. Most significant of all was the General Post Office, just across the O'Connell Street Bridge on the north side of the Liffey. Here, James Connolly and Patrick Peirce were headquartered, and it was on the steps of the GPO that Peirce read the proclamation of the Irish Republic at the start of the Rising. 
with the new orange, white, and green tricolor flag of the Irish nation flying above the GPO, Purse read the stirring opening lines. Irishmen and Irish women, in the name of God and of the dead generations from which she receives her old tradition of nationhood, Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. This proclamation was to have a massive influence in the years to come, not least during the Irish Civil War, when diehard Republicans viewed any compromise of full independence as a sellout of the heroic martyrs who proclaimed the Republic in 1916. If the rebels truly believed the citizenry of Ireland would rise up and join them, they were sorely disappointed. Only a handful of sporadic actions occurred in the countryside. In the city of Dublin, citizens at first thought this was another drill by the volunteers. And when they realized it was a rebellion in earnest, many were more annoyed than inspired. Then when the killing and the destruction of the city reached its peak, many were outraged and condemning of the rebels. And when Peirce finally surrendered at the GPO on Saturday and the rebels were led away to prison, some in the jeering Dublin crowd spat at them. The failure of the rebel strategy was essentially one of numbers. Only one-third of the Dublin force turned out, and the plan of holding multiple sites throughout the city depended on communication and swift reinforcement that was simply impossible, given the paucity of rebel soldiers. It was easy for the British Army to isolate and neutralize each location. But the Army response was excessive and took little notice of the difference between civilian and rebel. There were many innocent casualties, including Francis Sheehy Skeffington, a well-known and highly regarded pacifist and friend of the writer James Joyce, who was arrested while trying to prevent citizens from looting Irish businesses, then shot and killed by an apparently insane British officer. General John Maxwell was the commander of the British forces in Dublin, and he declared martial law and responded with brutal suppression. Over the next 12 days, he thereby proceeded to execute by firing squad 15 of the most prominent leaders of the Rising, starting with Purse, Thomas McDonough, and Thomas Clark, who were shot at Kilmainham Jail. In the days that followed, Purse's younger brother Willie, John McBride, former husband of Maud Gunn, and Joseph Plunkett were among the executed. With each execution and the revealing of the rebels' poems and letters and the clear understanding that these were not German pawns or selfish criminals, the public sympathy for the rebels grew and grew. Soon, international outrage was voiced over the executions, which were quickly transforming the leaders into martyrs. Asquith hurried to Dublin and halted the killings, but too late to save Connolly. De Valera and Thomas Ashe were spared, as was one of the several women leaders, the Countess Markowitz, who had been active in the fighting at Stevens Green. But the irreparable damage had been done. The British response had turned the rebels into martyrs and turned what might have been almost a farce into a stirring sacrifice of heroism for Ireland. Revolution involves a delicate balancing act. Revolutionary vanguards require popular support while at the same time they must harness and guide their followers' energy and passions. Additionally, popular movements fail without leadership, spokespersons, and an ideological plan. Passions aroused can create disruption, but revolutionary leaders are needed to articulate a common strategy and advance an agenda. Take, for example, the Occupy Wall Street protests in the United States after the financial markets crisis and the following recession of 2008 and 2009. In September 2011, a group of protesters gathered at Manhattan's Zuccotti Park to condemn the inequity in economic power that divided the world into the fabulously wealthy 1% and the 
and the 99% to which everyone else belong. In rejecting top-down structures and the control of the many by the few, the movement eschewed leadership and became a laboratory for participatory democracy, according to the Washington Post. This message resonated across the country and across the world. But the protesters lacked leadership and concrete plans for action. It was an uprising, not a revolution. And so Occupy Wall Street eventually fizzled. Occupy Wall Street didn't dismantle American capitalism, nor the US political system, but it did attract the media and national attention and it became a social phenomenon. Of course, attracting media attention is part and parcel of any successful revolutionary movement. Successful revolutions require mass support. The message needs to go viral. This aspect of revolution predates Twitter and Facebook by a few hundred years. Before the American colonies declared independence from Britain, Revolutionary journalists and pamphleteers, such as Thomas Paine and Samuel Adams, first had to convince other colonists of the wisdom and righteousness of the independence cause. It's no small task to transform the world, a nation, or even a political system, and it's never quick. Although revolutions are typically commemorated on a specific date, they tend to be long-running disruptions that snake through several stages and can extend over many years. This points up the fact that National Independence Days and other commemorative dates tend to be both highly selective and subjective. Stated otherwise, how a revolution is remembered can vary tremendously over time. Indeed, the ways in which individuals, groups, and states remember and commemorate a revolution tell us as much about the present political situation as it does about the past. A revolution might be a triumph or tragedy, a success or horrible failure. Some revolutionaries are heroes, Others are villains, traitors, and terrorists. We must acknowledge not only the winners, but also the losers who fall along the way. When we do, revolution becomes more than a caricature. It becomes more than a symbol. It becomes more than a singular moment that is celebrated annually. It becomes part of history and an essential element of the human experience. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch them all on Wondrium. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel for new episodes of Perspectives, and you can watch previous ones here.